our own famous evolutionary biologist, uh, Mirin Vatwe's um, 60th birthday occasion. So it's a good coincidence. J Jerry Cohen doesn't need any introduction. Uh, his, about him is already uh, circulated as part of the posters for those uh, students who are here who have not heard uh, his work before. And for many of us, uh, although we are meeting him for the first time, uh, his work is very familiar, his books are very familiar, and a large number of you know, the, the common contacts uh, between him and others. And there are few people in the audience who have met him personally earlier. And um, you know, I think, as I told you, uh, people like Jerry or Richard Dawkins don't need any introduction, so better not to introduce and try to take the, much of the time away from their talk. So, Jerry, you're here. First, oh, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Am I too loud? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, thanks for coming, and happy birthday, uh, Millen, because this is part of his celebration. And I wanted to also thank Icer, and especially Shashi, for arranging my visit, because he's done a tremendous amount of work to get me not only here, but four other cities in India. So I'm grateful to be here. It's one of my favorite places. And I hope to enlighten you a bit about speciation, and particularly the genetics of speciation. And in Drosophila, you've seen this organism before. Um, so my work, over, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about the work over the past 10 years. I'm retired now, but some of it is published and some of it's not. But the work has all been on the genetics of speciation. That is, what happens genetically when a new species forms. And in order to answer that question, you have to, first of all, define what you mean by species. I'm using the correct definition of species, which is the one that was suggested by Ernst Meyer back in the 1940s, which is a species is a group of interbreeding organisms that has reproductive barriers that keep it from exchanging genes with other organisms. So for example, you start with a lineage A, and it bifurcates into species B and C. And the characteristics of B and C are such that there are genetically based barriers that keep them from exchanging genes. Those are called reproductive isolating barriers. And how they form and the genetic basis of them is the subject of what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to use two particular species I've been working on as an example of what happens. Of course, I can't answer every question about speciation just using two flies. But we can make some generalizations that apply to other groups. So if you want to study the genetics of speciation, there's basically three requirements. If you want to study it properly, there are three requirements that you have to have for material in the laboratory. The first of it is that they have to be recently diverged. You want species that are very close together because you, don't, you want to be able to look at the events that caused the reproductive barriers themselves. If you look at something like a human or a lemur, for example, which are 50 million years diverged or so, you're not going to know anything about the differences between humans and chimps, which is a speciation event. So you want things that, are just, that have just recently formed and are each other's closest relatives, which is as close as you can get to the moment of speciation that's possible. Second of all, you have to be able to do genetics. Speciation. Now, my definition of genetics means making a cross, because I'm old school, instead of just sequencing DNA. And in fact, this is required if you're trying to understand the genetic basis of different species traits. You have to be able to cross them. So there has to be at least some way in the laboratory, not necessarily nature, that they can produce fertile hybrids. And then you can do back crosses, or F2s, which is required for genetic analysis. This is what you do in the lab using Drosophila melanogaster. And finally, ideally, because some of the barriers that keep species apart are based on ecology, even though they're genetically coded in the genome, you want species that live in the same place because you want to ideally investigate every possible kind of barrier that exists. And some of those are based on ecological preferences, as is the one I'm going to talk about today. So these are the requirements, what you want. And this is what I was looking for when I was trying to study the genetics of speciation. Now, this is the group I was working on. As many of you will be familiar with it. It's the best studied genetic group of organisms there is, the Drosophila melanogaster subgroup. And up until the year 2000, it contained nine species, whose, sorry, eight species, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whose, um, whose phylogenetic relationships were well known from chromosomes, from DNA, from proteins, et cetera. And this is the phylogeny. 
The eyes after the species mean that they're endemics to islands. This went to Mauritius and this one to the Seychelles, respectively. Now, the problem with using this group, even though it's the genetically best characterized group of organisms we know, is that none of the species until the year 2000 fulfilled all three requirements. We had sister species, like this pair, and we had species that were, could be crossed with each other and produce fertile hybrids, like all these pairs, but we had no species that lived in the same place. So we, that requirement three was not satisfied. And so you could do some genetic work, and there was a lot in this group, but you couldn't satisfy every requirement. And particularly, you couldn't look at ecology, because ecology is a very important part of the speciation process. Speciation does not happen in a glass tube in the laboratory. It happens in the field, and sometimes selection pressures are important. It turns out in the year 2000, my colleague Daniel Lachez, he's now deceased, but in Paris, discovered a new species. First there was Zikuba, and then he discovered on the island of Santomea, which is off the coast of Africa, there's the eye for Ireland, a sister species, Drosophila santomea. These species happen to be sympatric. They live together on the island of Santome. They're cross-fertile in that the female hybrids are fertile, the males are sterile, but you can still cross them together and do back crosses. And they're sister species, and they're young. This divergence is about 400,000 years. So this is a fairly young pair of species in Drosophila. So here we have a pair that satisfies all three requirements for studying the genetics of speciation. And so this, this is the pair of flies that I'm going to talk about today. First of all, a bit about their biogeography. So Drosophila acuba is widespread in sub-Saharan Africa. It's found in grasslands, savannas, and open forests. It tends to be an open area kind of fly. But it's also found on the island of San Tome, along with its sister species, Drosophila santomea, which is endemic to that island and found nowhere else. A bit more about the biogeography. So those species live on this island. It's about 1,000 square kilometers, and it lies about 250, 300 kilometers off the west coast of Africa, due west of Gabon in the Atlantic Ocean. This is a volcanic island. In fact, it's part of a whole chain of volcanic islands that comes from the edge of, called the Cameroon Volcanic Chain. And San Tome and its sister island, Principe, are, can constitute the nation of San, so San Tome. But Drosophila San Tome, the endemic species, lives only on this island, along with Drosophila Yacuba, its presumed ancestral species, which came over from Africa at some point. Now, this is a volcanic island like the Galapagos. It has a peak at about 2,024 meters right there. And I think of this as sort of like the Galapagos of the Atlantic Ocean. First of all, this island lies right on the equator, just like the Galapagos. That's the equator just a few miles south of the part of the island. And it has a lot of endemic species, not just Drosophila santomea. It has, for example, 21 endemic species of birds, which happen to be exactly the same number of endemic species of birds on the whole Galapagos archipelago. And it has lots of endemic plants, the most famous of which is the giant begonia. But on this island live both species, the sister species, Drosophila santomea and Yacuba, and they're 400,000 years old. So we have a young pair of species, and as you'll see in a minute, they partially overlap in their ecological um, locations. Just a slight bit of tourism. This is what the island looks like when you're standing at sea level. So here I am just a few meters above the ocean, and that's the Pico de San Tomé at 2024. Our field work is conducted along a transect that goes behind this mountain and then up to the very top. Okay. And then when you climb up to the top, which is a rather arduous trek, because not many people go there, and you stand at the top and look down, this is what you see. So it's a very beautiful place to work, but it's also a difficult place to work, A, getting there, and B, having to eat spaghetti and sardines every day, three meals a day, for seven days a week. So um, if you haven't eaten spaghetti and sardines cold in the morning every day, then you haven't lived. <laughs> but this is what we go through to try to study speciation. So. Occasionally a reminder of the volcanic origin of the islands. This is a road cut, and you can see these basaltic columns here. The islands are probably about 12 to 14 million years old. The flies are younger than that, and these islands may have been submerged, gone up and down below sea level due to changes in sea level. We're not quite sure about that. We know how old the islands are, and we know how old the flies are. Okay. 
If you do a transect of these, where these flies live on San Tomé, and you start at the sea level, and you go up to, say, 1,700 meters, you'll see that in this area, the lowest area, the inhabited area, you see mostly Drosophila yacuba, the fly from Africa that lives in open habitats. And in fact, this is, op this is open habitat too. It's mostly plantations, cocoa, banana, um, and coffee plantations. So it's largely cut over, and that's the kind of habitat you would find Drosophila yacuba in in Africa, and that's where you find it here. As you go higher and higher up, you begin to approach the rainforest, which starts right about where the national park boundary is, and you begin to see the sister species, the endemic Drosophila santomea. And in fact, Drosophila yacuba disappears. This is the percentage of flies. It goes to zero up there. And then Drosophila santomea up to 1,700 meters. There is, however, interestingly, a hybrid zone right there between about 1,100 and 1,500 meters where you find both species together. And in that hybrid zone, you can find hybrids which innate, so these species are indeed mating with each other in the wild, and from that you can study a number of phenomena that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, the first question I want to ask is, how did the speciation occur in this group? Because there's two possible ways it could have happened. First of all, you could have had an ancestor of Drosophila yacuba inhabit the, these flies were not spontaneously generated on the island. Their ancestor had to come from somewhere. It's a volcanic <laughs> island. Darwin was the first one to figure that out. Um, the Drosophila yacuba ancestor could have come from the mainland, and then on the island, that species could have speciated, split into two, right on this very small island. Santa Maria and yacuba on the island, as opposed to yacuba on the mainland. This is a sympatric speciation event because the speciation event happened on this very, in, within a very small area. Now, if this is the way it happened, you would expect to see a phylogeny that looks like this. That is, the outgroup, the original ancestor, is Yacuba on the mainland. And then on the island, these would be each other's closest relatives because they split from each other on San Tomé. So this is the phylogeny you'd see. You follow me so far? So it seems like, well, you could do a phylogeny and figure out whether speciation happened this way. This is a, a hotly contested area in evolutionary biology. And in fact, if you look at mitochondrial DNA, this is exactly what you see, that these two are very closely related and they're different more different from Yacuba that's over in Africa. So you can conclude that maybe this was a sympatric speciation event, which is something that nobody really thinks happens very often. Unfortunately, this is wrong because mitochondrial DNA gives you the wrong answer about, how, about phylogenies. And if there's any lesson that you should take home from this talk, do not use mitochondrial DNA to make phylogenies, at least if you have other kinds of DNA available. The other scenario is what we call the double invasion scenario. That is, Drosophila yacuba move, moves to the island like before, but then on the island, it did not split. That lineage simply evolved into Drosophila santomea in a anagenetic matter. A, a single lineage changed over time in isolation. And then later, Drosophila yacuba invaded again. And that's what accounts for the presence of both species on the island. It's called double invasion scenario. This is an allopatric form of speciation. It requires geographic isolation between this species and the one, this population and the one on the island. And if that's the way it happened, you'd expect to see a phylogeny that looks like that. That is, this, the secondary colonizer would be more closely related to the ancestral population. And Santa Bea, which would have been the first group to invade the island, would be off separately as an outgroup. OK, so we get two different phylogenies depending on um, which way the speciation event happened. And in fact, that's the phylogeny you see if you look at the other kinds of DNA, Y chromosome and nuclear DNA. So we have two different scenarios of speciation, each one supported by a different phylogeny. Which one is the right one? This is the right one, OK? And this is the right one because the mitochondrial DNA is not a reliable indicator of ancestry in not only this case, but in many cases as well. But I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. OK, now I'll introduce you to the flies. Well, if you, if you work with them, you know that they look like that. That's a male, and it has a black butt. I don't know what the Hindi word for butt is, but it has a black tuchus, we'd say in Yiddish. Um, and the females have stripes, but they're, they have, they're pigmented with melanin pigment. Whereas Drosophila santomea, both males and females, and this is a male, completely lack the pigment at all. 
I think that's why they weren't even identified as in the Melanogaster group, because they look so different from other species. The first thing you look at for a species in this group is the pigmentation, the butt. Okay. This, these are all nine species now in the Drosophila melanogaster subgroup, and that's Drosophila santomea. So you can see it's the only species. The rest of them look pretty much the same. You have to look at the genitals of the genes to tell them apart. But this clearly is different, and that means that this is a derived trait. The ancestral trait has to have been pigmentation, the derived condition, and we don't know why this evolved, except that it's probably due to selection of a sort. More on that in a second. But it is a derived characteristic, okay? And it is the unique morphological trait of this species, the one that can identify it. Other differences between Santa Maria and the, and the other species, the shape of the genitals. There's Drosophila Yacuba. These are the claspers that the male grabs the female with. In his genitals, Yacuba and Santa Maria, they have very different shapes. This is almost the law of biology, that if you find two closely related species that are almost impossible to tell apart, if there's one trait that you can use to tell them apart, it's the male genitalia, okay? I don't think there's a name for it. I'd like to call it coin's rule or something, um, but there's already one of those. So, again, that holds in Drosophila Cuban Santa Maria, and it holds for the rest of the species in the Melanogaster subgroup. The most important things as a student of speciation that we're interested in is the reproductive barriers between these species. And it turns out that there's a lot of them that even though they're young species, 400,000 years, there's a lot of things that keep them from exchanging genes, both in the laboratory and in the field. For example, th these are, there are three forms of reproductive isolation that people usually use, prezygotic isolation, or pre-mating isolation before they actually copulate, and these are the different forms that these species have. The most important ones are the ecological differences, because they tend to frequent different areas of the island, even though there's an overlap one high, one low, and they're strongly sexually isolated. They do not like to mate with each other, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later. Then we have what we call post-mating prezygotic isolation. Those reproductive barriers that act after copulation and fertilization have occurred, but before a zygote is formed. And there's several of these. Um, for example, sperm of one species of male is toxic to females of the other. If you inseminate a Santa Maria with Yacuba sperm, she won't live as long as she would have if she was inseminated by her males of her own sperm. So this separate evolution has made the sperm of one male toxic to the other. There's also what we call conspecific sperm precedence. If you inseminate a female of either species with sperm from males of both species, she will produce offspring only from the conspecific mating. For some reason, the sperm from the other male gets lost in a way that we don't quite understand. But of course, this keeps them from exchanging genes. And finally, there's the famous postzygotic isolation, which is forms of reproductive barriers that occur after the species have already formed zygotes. And the most important, well, there's some developmental problems in the hybrids, but the most important one is that there's hybrid sterility. That all of the male hybrids, if you mate them together, are completely sterile. The females are, as far as we can tell, very fertile, as fertile as pure species. But you can see this, the combination of all these barriers taken together means that there's probably very little gene flow between these species. And in fact, there, we'll show you the evidence that that is indeed the case. The lesson here is that even in very young species, lots of different barriers have evolved in concert with one another. There's not just one thing that prevents gene flow. There's lots of different things, okay? Now, my question was, well, what about the genetics? How many genes are involved in making these reproductive barriers? And can that tell us anything about the process of speciation? And so in order to do that, we do what we call QTL mapping. How many of you have heard of QTL mapping or do QTL mapping? I'll try to explain it briefly. Um, it's not that, it's basically just using back cross analysis, but using molecular markers instead of eye color mutants or wing mutants, et cetera. So this requires that you do a cross, and this is why my concept of genetics means making a cross. What you do is you start with both species and you cross them together to make a hybrid. Here's one of these hybrids with the blue chromosomes being from Santa Maya and the red chromosomes being from Yacuba. These species have four pairs of chromosomes, a telocentric X and two metacentric autosomes and a very tiny telocentric fourth chromosome. And you can see that in this F1, and this is a female because it has two X chromosomes, 
she has half of her genome from Drosophila sensibe and half of them from Yukuba. So you take these females, and then you mate them, and you can't mate them to their brothers because their brothers are sterile. Remember, the F1 males are sterile. So you have to back cross them to either Drosophila sensibe males or Drosophila Yukuba males. This is a male because you see it only has one X chromosome. It has a Y too, but I didn't show that. There are no inversions that differentiate these two species, so there's nothing to impede recombination. What happens is when these females form eggs, there's going to be recombination between the chromosomes, and you're going to get offspring of this cross that who, who half of ge their genome comes from the male parent, and the other half is a mixture of genes from Drosophila centimea and Drosophila yacuba. And you can see the mixture. Parts of the chromosomes are red and parts of them are blue. OK, so how do we identify them? Well, what we do is we do sequencing of DNA to find diagnostic differences between the genomes. So therefore, if we can sequence the fly, and we can certainly sequence a fly, either a single fly, or we, but we use a number of markers, we can determine what parts of its genome come from Santa Maya and what parts of it come from Yakua. Before we sequence it, we look at these flies. For example, if we're doing the genetics of pigmentation, we'll measure how black this fly is. Is it black? Is it yellow? And we actually quantitate that using a sort of semi-sophisticated eyeball test, the EBT, to see how dark it is. Or we can look at its behavior, its sexual behavior. Or we can see whether it's sterile or fertile. Or we can look at any number of the reproductive barriers that separate these species, and then correlate those, how strong those traits are with the genetic nature of the fly itself. So we're comparing its genetic composition with its phenotype or its behavior. And that's the way we map these changes. Can you follow that so far? This is called QTL, quantitative trait locus mapping. Back in the old days, we used morphological markers like you know, uh, orange eyes and shriveled wings. But there's only a limited number of markers you can use on a fly before it dies. Five is about the limit you can use before the fly becomes so sick that you can't use it. The advantage of using molecular markers is you don't have to use morphological mutations. Now, we do this for any trait for using 1,500 flies for both back crosses, because you need to avoid artifacts, which are pervasive in this kind of work. So each cross I show you will involve at least 3,000 flies that have been genotyped and then measured for some trait. OK, and here's, so the first thing I wanted to do was look at the, the uh, genetic basis of the color difference. Be, not because we know that it causes reproductive barriers. We don't know if the flies use color as a way to tell each other apart. In fact, I kind of doubt it, but it's possible it's involved in sexual isolation. It's certainly a trait we want to know whether it's just due to one gene or many genes. And so first of all, we found diagnostic differences between the two species for each of these 32 QTL markers spread evenly throughout the genome. So we have good coverage of the entire genome. We don't have any, I mean, remember, there's 15,000 genes in this species. But at this time, which is about seven or eight years ago, these are the markers that we use. And then we look at the pigmentation difference. So this is how the QTL markers work. You, each of, this is the, these are the four chromosomes all lined up, X, second, and third. There's nothing on the fourth, so I've left this out. And you simply march along the chromosome, and there's each of the molecular markers we have. And for each marker, we can tell, is that the Santa Maya marker or the Yacuba marker? And then we look at the flies and see whether they're dark or light. And in that way, we can see which regions of the genome are associated with dark versus light pigmentation. So, and you get what you call a QTL map. This is what it is. And each time you see a peak, you see that the markers in that region are associated with color. And we do this by blind comparison, independent testing of the color versus, versus the uh, QTL markers. And here we see that the blue is the males. This is the back cross to Drosophila yacuba. And the pink are the peaks for females. And then this is the back cross to Drosophila santamea. So we do two back crosses. Each one of these is based on 3,000 flies and about 23 markers. And you can see right off the bat that there's at least four peaks that are involved in this color difference. For example, this one is a very big one on the X chromosome. And you can also see that those peaks are in the same position for both males and females, which means that the same genes that make the males dark in Drosophila yacuba versus Santa Maya are the same genes that make the females dark. 
Well, that's not much of a surprise, is it? I mean, it would be the same gene, probably. It'd be odd if it was different. And they're in the same position in both bat crosses as well. So what we can say right off the bat is there's at least four genetic substitutions that have made this color difference. It's not a single macro mutation, but at least four. But in fact, there are more than four, because each one of these genetic regions encompasses hundreds of genes. Remember, there's 15,000 genes in Drosophila. So right here, there's probably about four or 500 genes, and we only have like 10 markers, so our discriminatory power is low. When we do finer structure mapping using deletions, we find that in this peak, there are at least four genes. So that right off the bat means that there's eight instead of four, but then if we do complete deletion mapping, we found that there's at least 14 genes that have changed to make this color difference. And of those 14, and they act additively, and they're in the same place for males and females. There's no epistasis going on here. Fine structure mapping has shown of those 14, 12 of them act in the way you'd expect. That is, of these 14 regions, 12 of them, if they come from Yakuba, make the fly darker. If they come from Santa Maya, they make the fly lighter. So in general, 12 out of the 14 are acting in the direction you'd expect. Now that's a statistically significant difference from seven and seven, which is what you'd expect if random genetic drift were causing this difference. Then there, half the genes would be one way, half the other way. 12 out of 14 is significant. What that means is that there's probably selection that caused this difference. What kind of selection it is, we don't know. What, it could be natural selection. We don't know why. Or it could be sexual selection. Um, but at least we can tell that this is a, a polygenic character. There's lots of genes, probably many more than this, of relatively small additive effect. And they're in the same place for males and females. So we don't know if that's a trait involved in reproductive isolation. But here's one that is hybrid sterility, because the males are sterile. That means that if you cross the two species, already gene flow between them is cut down by 50% because half of the offspring are completely useless in an evolutionary sense. So if you can study the genetic basis of hybrid sterility of the males, then you know something about the genetics that have been involved in, maybe in at least some of the speciation process. Now, as I said, when you cross these species together, the males are sterile and the females are fertile. Um, this is a general pattern in all animals. It's called Haldane's Rule because it was named after J.B.S. Haldane, who spent the last part of his life in Calcutta in India. Um, I can't remember the name of this guy, Mah Manalobius. Or, yeah, he was a co-founder of the, the Indian Statistical Institute. But that's J.B. Haldane, and he pronounced what he called Haldane's Rule, which is if you cross two species together and only one of the two sexes of offspring is sterile or inviolable, it is invariably the heterogametic sex the sex that has two different sex chromosomes. This holds, this is, if there's any law in biology, I think there's actually three laws in biology. There's the genital law that I've already described. There's Haldane's rule, which holds that about 95% of all animals that have ever been looked at. If you make a species cross and one sex is sterile and viable, it's the heterogametic sex. I mean, this is interesting because we don't have laws. In, it's not even a law. It's a generalization, but it's a very widely held generalization in evolutionary biology. The other one I'll just mention is that if one sex is brightly colored or has calls or is attractive or has plumage, it's almost invariably males. Okay. We understand the basis of that one. It's sexual selection. That's probably the explanation for the genital law. This one, we don't know the explanation, but there's two possible ones that have been suggested. The first one is simply that males are more sensitive to hybridization, that perhaps spermatogenesis is so complicated that if you, it takes place in a hybrid individual, it's more likely to be screwed up than oogenesis in females. Okay, that was one of the first hypotheses made. Unfortunately, that one doesn't work. Because in a lot of animals, in particular birds and butterflies, the heterogametic sex is female. So in, in, they call them XW, but you could say XY. In birds and butterflies, for example, females are XW. And in fact, it is the female sex that is the one that was missing. That's why Haldane's rule is characterized as a difference in, in sterility of heterogametic individuals, not males. So the observation that this rule also holds for birds and butterflies, which have the opposite form of sex determination, is an indication that that theory is wrong, that males aren't special or sensitive to hybridization. The other explanation is that there's something about the X chromosome itself 
that makes these hybrids sterile, in particular, their possession of a single X chromosome makes them more liable to be sterile than species, the, the sex that has two X chromosomes. Why would that be? Well, perhaps, for example, there are recessively acting genes in hybrids, that are exp and those recessively acting genes will be expressed on the X chromosome, because the X chromosome expresses every gene it has, whether it's recessive or dominant. Whereas, if those recessive genes are masked in the homogametic sex, um, you would expect these to be fertile. So that theory predicts that if you map the genes causing sterility, you're going to find that most of them reside on the X chromosome. These two theories make different predictions. And in fact, we did a quantitative trait analysis of male sterility in this species, and that's what you see. There's the X, there's the second, there's the third. And you can see right off the bat that the, just look at the blue there. These are just different ways of measuring sterility. This is sperm motility. And you can see that right off the bat, the X chromosome carries the overwhelming number of effects that make these males sterile. Okay. So this supports the hypothesis that there's something special about the X chromosome that causes Haldane's rule to be effective. Okay. And I, I could go on about that. You can ask questions afterwards, and I'll try to answer them. Okay, so that's a one form of reproductive isolation. What about sexual isolation? As I said before, there's prezygotic isolation. These flies do not like to mate with each other. How much do they not like to mate with each other? Here's some data on that. What I did was just confine a single male and a single female from all four pairings of these species for an hour in a vial, and you simply get an undergraduate. Nowadays, they have video cameras to do this, but back in those days, we watched them. And this is the number of matings that occur out of 100 in an hour period. And you can see the two homogametic matings, Yucuba by Yucuba, Santomea by Santomea, they mate pretty well, 80%, 65%. If you watch them all night, and I don't, I don't want my undergraduates to do that. They'd fall asleep, for one thing. Um, it would be about 100%. This is just an hour of watching. Many of you have probably watched flies mate. The males go after the females, um, and the females refuse to mate with them. And after a while, they relent, just like in humans. That's by, another, by the way, that's another rule of biology <laughs> that we have a good explanation for based on, um, on reproductive investment. I just want you to pay attention briefly. The, the cross that's the hardest to make is the one with Santa Maya females and Yucuba males. And if you watch this cross, you'll see that these males court these females like crazy. They run after them. They vibrate their wings and circle around them. And the females just kick them off. And they keep kicking them off for an hour or so. And, but the important point is that if you see this kind of sexual isolation, that means that there's been genetic change in both males and females since the speciation event. These females no longer recognize that male as their an appropriate mate. So that means that something has changed in the males of Yucuba, between Yucuba and Santa Maya. But not only that, the Yucuba males are not recognized as appropriate mates, so the males have changed. And something has changed in the Drosophila Santa Maya females, where she will recognize her own male as an appropriate mate, but not another male. So there's been a change in both some trait of the males and a change in the female preference for the males. Whenever you see sexual isolation, it means that there's been evolutionary change in both males and females. So you can study that change by doing this kind of QTL analysis. Now, this is hard to do. This, Behavioral, if you work on Drosophila behavior, you're going to know it's extremely sensitive to the environment. Depending on the barometric pressure or what music you play in the laboratory, someday all the flies will mate, someday none of the flies will mate. So what that means is it's noisy, and it's hard to do these kinds of experiments. But at least you can get some result. And this is the sexual isolation that's the things that have changed in females. These are just back-crossed F1 females crossed to Drosophila Santa Maya males. So they're mostly Santa Maya females, three quarters of them. And that means they reject Drosophila Yucuba males. And then we put them with Drosophila Yucuba males, and we look at their genotypes, and we see where are the regions that have to be Drosophila Santa Maya regions in order to cause that rejection. And lo and behold, there's sort of two of them. These are the different back-crosses. But the overwhelming effect is on the third chromosome. So there's a minimum of two genes. This is the best we can do with behavior. Right now, we're trying to find structure map this. But this is not like pigmentation or sterility. It's a very flexible, environmentally malleable phenotype. And it's hard to do this kind of work. 
You can also do it in the males. Look at what parts of the males have to be Drosophila yucuba before they're rejected by Drosophila santomea, and you get a much noisier graph, but at least you can see there's two regions, also in the third chromosome, but they're not in the same region as Drosophila santomea, which means that the genes for female discrimination are different from the genes of the male trait that are discriminated against. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's no reason why the preferences have to involve the same genes as the traits that are preferred or not preferred, okay? One of them might be, for example, pheromones, and the other might be, for example, those olfactory receptors that detect pheromones, and those will be different genetic systems. And right now we're working on um, whether or not this, um, we're trying to find out the genes that are responsible here. Um, so there's different genes in males and females. Now the interesting thing about this species, which we could not do in any of the other species in this group, is study what happens in the hybrid zone. Because these species do have an opportunity to mate with each other in nature in that hybrid zone between 1,100 and 1,500 meters. And there are four things we can study in this hybrid zone that we could not study in any other species. And I'll go over, um, you don't have, I'm not gonna talk about these at this moment, but I'll just go through them one more one very briefly. How many of you have heard of reinforcement, if you've studied evolution? Okay, so it's all the professors have heard of that. None of the students, you need to read your Dubshansky or your Ernst Meyer or your Doug Fatima textbook. It's a phenomenon that happens when two species have overlapping ranges, such as these do. When two species have overlapping ranges and they produce hybrids that there's something wrong with, as in this case, because half of the hybrids are sterile, then you would expect that natural selection would work to make them less likely to mate with each other, but only in the area of overlap. So in this area of overlap, which is the hybrid zone on the island, the flies mate with each other, half the offspring of a heterospecific mating are sterile. You'd expect that natural selection in that area would make them less likely to mate with each other, because those flies that are less likely to mate with each other are the ones that produce the most fertile, viable offspring. But that kind of selection would not work in areas where the species don't meet each other. It only operates to reduce hybridization, and hybridization only occurs in the area of overlap. So this is called reinforcement because it reinforces the other reproductive barriers. And it was once thought to be very important in speciation. In fact, according to Dubshansky, it was inevitable that this would happen. Unfortunately, so we tested this. I mean, this can, there are very few species that you can actually test it, but we can look at Drosophila yucuba females, for example, from the region of overlap, sympatric. This, this is in the hybrid, hybrid zone on the island. And allopatric, ones that are up above that hybrid zone, or sorry, either on the mainland Africa or down below the hybrid zone, and see if the sexual isolation with the other species is higher in the area of overlap. And this is the data. You can see it's not. Sexual isolation is about the same. Why it hasn't increased? We would expect it to be higher here because of natural selection to reinforce mating discrimination, but it isn't. We can get, it to, we can get this to happen in the lab by co-rearing the flies, but it doesn't seem to have happened in nature. And I could talk about why some hypotheses for this later. But there is this form of a special kind of of um, reinforcement, reinforcement for post-mating prezygotic isolation in Drosophila yucuba females. So if you take Drosophila yucuba females from the area of overlap and from the area where they're allopatric, either mainland Africa or at the bottom of the island, and you mate them to Drosophila santomea males, and then look at the number of offspring they produce, you can see that the females from the hybrid zone produce many fewer offspring. This is, this is proportion to the conspecific mating. They produce less than half as many offspring as allopatric females. Remember, this is the same species of females. It's just these are taken from the overlap area. These are taken from the areas where they don't overlap. So there's been some evolutionary change in the females in the area of overlap that make them not produce as many offspring if they're mated to the wrong male. And this is a form of reinforcement because it's some kind of selection is acted to prevent gene flow in the area of overlap. Now, does anybody know why females in the area of overlap might be selected to have fewer offspring if they mate with the wrong species? Does anybody have any idea? Well, what happens if you mate with the wrong species? You lose half your offspring, right? 
What's, what would happen if you got rid of that sperm? Suppose you made it with the wrong species and you dumped that sperm really quickly, um, as these flies seem to do. Well, then that means you get a chance to mate correctly with the Drosophila yucuba females. So if you, get, if you find out, and find out means some physiological reaction, that you've made it wrongly, and you can detect that and affect it by getting rid of that sperm, then you have a chance to mate properly and you will pr increase your fitness over time. So natural selection seems to have acted here to cause a form of sperm rejection in the area where the species overlap in the range. And we think this is true for several reasons. First of all, the main one being that we can reproduce this in the laboratory. We can take species, strains that have never encountered each other before, put them in a vial, and let them sit for five generations. And at the end of that five generations, you'll find that those females no longer produce as many offspring as they did eventually. There's been an evolutionary change. We can reproduce this in the laboratory. Whereas if we keep them separate, they produce offspring like this. So we've seen a form of, of uh, reinforcement, but it's different from the kind that most people thought occurred. Okay, so the species do exchange some genes in the area of sympatry. How many genes do they exchange? How permeable is a species to the introgression of genes from another species? Is it completely impermeable, or can there be a little bit of gene flow between species? When we submitted our first paper to evolution on this, it was rejected. Um, and it was rejected for a really stupid reason. Here's a quote from reviewer number two of Cornet et al. 2005. The, and basically, this person, I don't know if it was male or female, this person rejected the paper because the population is significantly hybridized in the wild, and so they're not really two different species to begin with. Okay. This is what we call a stupid reviewer <laughs> in the field, because if you look at the species to begin with, they live together and maintain their distinctness. They look differently from one another. The hybrids are sterile. They have definite morphological differences in both genitalia and pigmentation, and they don't like to mate with each other. I mean, you'd be crazy not to say that if these aren't species, they're at least something pretty close to species. But this person wanted to reject the paper because he thought, well, they're just populations of, of a single species. Well, that, that's wrong. And we were just wrote back to the editor and said, this is crazy. Um, just look at these species, and the paper was accepted. I mean, you're going to encounter this if you're young in your lifetime. There is no shortage of clueless reviewers in this world. But, but that, this got us thinking, well, how much gene exchange is there really between these species? Do they exchange any genes at all? I mean, we know they keep them, themselves pretty distinct in terms of mating discrimination, in terms of sterility, in terms of morphology, but can any genes get through at all? And so we decided to investigate that question, how much intergression there is between the two species. And there are two ways to do this, okay? The first one is to look at what we call shared polymorphism. So if we have two species that are exchanging genes, or supposedly originally they start out different, and this one has allele A, so it's AA at, one, at, that, at A locus, and this one is BB at the same locus because there's been evolutionary divergence. If there's gene flow, then you might expect that both, that this one would become AB and this one would become AB. That is, they're sharing their genes at a locus that have previously diverged, so we have what we call shared polymorphism. And this happens in regions where there's normal recombination. Now, there's another way that can happen, too. If the ancestor is AB, and polymorphic, then both species will inherit AB too, and it will look like there's hybridization. So we have to do simulations based on coalescent theory to see if this is really a shared polymorphism due to hybridization or something inherited from the common ancestor. It's a lot easier, because you don't have to do simulations, to look at regions of low recombination, because then you simply look at the, the genetic divergence between the two species. And if the genetic divergence is lower, then that probably means that in that region where there's not so much genetic divergence, they've exchanged genes, and they look similar to one another. In order to do that, though, because there's different amounts of, of selection that separate species or drift, you have to have a control pair of species to know how different they're supposed to be if there was no gene exchange. And fortunately, in this species, we have a control pair of species. That's this pair. Drosophila mercianna and Drosophila seychellia. These are species that are endemic to islands. They have no possibility of gene exchange because they live in different places. They've never been found in each other's islands. And 
coincidentally and fortunately, they're 400,000 years old, just like our pair. So what we can do is compare the degree of genetic divergence of this pair with the genetic divergence of the, the pair we have and see which regions of Drosophila yacuba and Drosophila santomea are much more closely related than regions of this allopatric pair. And then you can do statistical tests and show that whether that's significantly more similar than these species, and, and that would be a region in which there has been gene exchange between the sympatric species. So fortunately, we have the material to do this kind of test. And here's the results. Well, these are the genes, the areas we looked at. So look and see if there were gene exchange. We used uh, 29 genes, there was, including a mitochondrial gene, um, X, second, third, and one on the fourth chromosome as well. For each of those regions, we looked at regions of high and low recombination to see if there was any exchange of genes between these species. And the answer is not in general. This is our comparison for the regions of low recombination. Here's the control populations, Mauritia and Seychelles. They're allopatric. They've never met each other. They exchange no genes. So we can look at the genetic divergence in regions of low recombination on the Y chromosome. And in the nucleus, this is two genes, this is nine. That's the genetic divergence. We can compare that with the genetic divergence for the pair of equal age that live in the same place. And you can see it's the same. There's no significant difference between these, which means that for these genes, there's been no exchange of genes that have caused them to become more similar in, this, in the coexisting species than in the species that never encounter each other. But it's a different story if you look at the mitochondrion. Mauritia and Seychelles have a 4% divergence. They're allopatric. Yaku and Santomea, basically there's no difference between the mitochondrial DNA. They're almost identical. In fact, this is the Yacuba Santomea divergence is less than the divergence between Yacuba on the island and Yacuba on the mainland. This, is a, this implies an event, a hybridization event about 14,000 years ago, i.e. fairly recently. So we see a real difference. And what, what this means is that most of the genome, at least for these genes and the other genes as well, have remained separate. Even though they hybridize, the genes don't move between the two species. For some reason, they get kicked out um, because they probably cause a fitness problem. But for the mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondrion of Drosophila yacuba has completely moved into Santa Maria and taken it over. Okay. So here we have extensive introgression of mitochondrial DNA. It's not just in this species either. So here's another rule of biology. If there are any genes that move between hybridizing species, and this includes birds, um, all kinds of vertebrates, lots of insects, and even in plants, and also for chloroplast DNA, if there are any genes that move between species, it is going to be the genes of the mitochondria and the chloroplast, the organelles. That's exactly what's happened here. Now, that's two lessons for that. First of all, we don't know why that happens, but it happens. It's another sort of rule of biology. Why do the mitochondria so easily accepted by other species, whereas the nuclear DNA is not? And second of all, this explains why we got that wrong phylogeny. Why, when we looked at the mitochondria and we tried to make, build phylogeny, we saw that the, the species on the island were more similar to each other than Yacuba on the island and Yacuba on the mainland. This looks like a sympatric speciation event because these things are so similar to one another on the island. But it's wrong. And we know it's wrong because we looked at all the other genes, which tell a completely different story of you know, the phylogeny of species. There's a 56%, sorry, a 60% fold difference and divergence here. OK. So how much gene flow is there between these two species? Almost none, even though they hybridize. And so the reviewer number two was wrong completely. There's not significant hybridization between these species. These species are not, don't have islands of speciation. They have islands of introgression. The reason to introgress are these. The mitochondria introgresses big time. There's a little bit of introgression at the yellow gene and at the cellular gene, but not very much. So what we see here are, despite the opportunity to hybridize, and the fact that the F1 females are fertile, which could allow gene flow, not much gene flow is going on in these species. We did another experiment in the lab. I'm just going to skip over this very quickly. But we made a hybrid swarm of these two species, a 
population in a bottle, and we did this with three pairs of species, that has 50% of the, of the DNA, nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome DNA, and cytoplasm from each of the species, and then we just let it run for 20 generations, and we wanted to know if we could make a new species by hybridizing these species and creating a mixed genome. Now, from the introgression data that I just showed you, you'd expect that that probably wouldn't happen. The species don't like to have genes from the other species in there. And I won't go through the data, except that in every single case, and that's eight replicates of each of these three hybridizations, it reverts to a pure species within 20 generations, both morphologically, in this case, Yucuba. So after 20 generations, the hybrid swarm looks exactly like Drosophila Yucuba. It's black. It has Yucuba-like genitals. It discriminates against Drosophila santomea, but not against Yucuba and it's sterile when it's crossed with Drosophila santomea. And we looked at regions of ge genetic introgression. These are 250,000 DNA SNPs that we've looked at. Mostly Yucuba, these are each of the eight replicates, this is just one. Mostly santomea, none, and some regions of genetic mixture, this is after 20 generations. And you can see that almost all the genome, even after 20 generations, has reverted back to one pure species, which goes along with the morphological results. There is this region of introgression right there. This is the frequencies of different alleles. You can see it's remarkably consistent amongst the replicates. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. It confirms the results that we get from nature that these species do not like to have their genomes mixed up. In other words, the, genome, the genes of a species are co-adapted to like each other, to use a metaphor. They don't like to be together with genes from other species. When they get that, they kick them out. In other words, natural selection acts to eliminate gene flow. What about the mitochondrial DNA? As you might expect, the mitochondrial DNA stays polymorphic in these species. Sometimes it reverts to Drosophila yucuba. It's, it's becomes, it, there's a lot more mitochondrial introgression tolerated than nuclear introgression, which goes along perfectly with the results on the island. And I won't go through that. Um, what, okay, so we're near the end now. What prevents the fusion of the species? Well, we know what keeps these species apart. Hybrid sterility, 50% of the gene flow is cut off right there. Sexual isolation, about another 50-60%. Other forms of post-mating isolation, conspecific sperm pressing and sperm dumping. Take these together, there's almost 100% reproductive isolation right there. These are good species if you combine them. And finally, there are these ecological differences, which are maybe the first ones to evolve, and they're very profound because they keep the species from even encountering each other, which is a very important form of reproductive isolation. It's not just geographic isolation, it's biologically based geographic isolation, and it's based on the preferences of these species to live in different places, which is a genetic adaptation. Now, if you studied yourself in the lab, you learned that their ecology consists of crawling around the bottom of plastic bottles, <laughs> and that's all there is. And in fact, it's hard, it's impossible to study ecology of Drosophila in the laboratory. Except, well, this is one exception, but it's also impossible to study it in the wild. If we try to find these flies on Santa May, we can't. So we'll go up to looking for Drosophila santomea, and we'll crawl around in the ground for a week, and we'll look for fruits or berries, and we'll bring them back and rear them out. We'll use vacuum cleaners to suck the trees and the leaves looking for flies. We've never found a single fly. And yet, if you put out a bucket of banana mash, within 10 minutes, there's 1,000 flies in there. Where are they? We don't have the slightest idea. And this is true in general of many species including Drosophila pseudobscura, which we worked on. It's almost as if the flies are spontaneously generated in banana mash. So, so, I mean, it's impossible to study the ecology in terms of breeding substrate or where they live. We've tried and we've failed. But at least we can study the temperature preference of these flies. And this is what we've done here. We've constructed what we call a thermocline. This is a simply an aluminum plate. This is really low-budget, dumb science, but it worked. We can put an aluminum plate, we put one end on a hot plate, 30 degrees, the other end on a cold plate, 18 degrees, and then we let it sit and we can equilibrate so this, we get a temperature gradient from 18 to 30 across this plate. And these, by the way, are both temperatures that are attained in the wild from um, these species. So these are ecologically realistic temperature. This one we see down at sea level very easily, gets higher than that, 37, 40. 18 degrees at the top of the mountain. It's chilly, mist forest, and it's cold up there. You have to wear a jacket. Then we put the flies in this device, and we let them sit there for an hour. 
We'll put the males of both species, for example, in there, and we can tell them apart because they're different colors. We don't have to mark them or anything like that, and we let them equilibrate. We do not put males and females in together because you know what's going to happen if you do that. They're going to be interested in something more than temperature. So we just use one sex, and they let them sit for an hour. They distribute themselves in these chambers, which have thermocouples, and then we slam this door shut. And then we count the number of flies in each area, and we've taken an average temperature by the thermocouples in there. And that way we can judge the temperature preference of these flies. And this is what we find. And we find exactly what we expected to find, that this is the average temperature preference of Drosophila santomea, the means and standard errors, two strains of each species, santomea yucuba and the F1 hybrids. Santomea prefers temperatures that are three degrees lower than yucuba in general. This is crude, but it's one of the few experiments at Drosophila that shows a really meaningful ecological difference between two species. This explains why Santabea is, well, it doesn't explain it, but it shows that it is adapted to living at high altitude on the mountain, whereas Yacuba is adapted to living in warmer temperatures lower down. It's not just the, the behavior or temperature preference. Well, I just want to point out that these are the F1 hybrids. You can see they're intermediate. These are the F1 hybrids with the Drosophila santomea mother, Drosophila yucuba father. This is the cross that's the hard cross to make. It's the one where there's strong sexual isolation. There's also difference in lethality. Drosophila yucuba that will pupate fine at 28 degrees. Santomea will all die before they never hatch at this temperature, which isn't that hot. So there's also an, a physiological difference between these flies and the high altitude fly has a severely reduced longevity at 28 degrees, and the hybrids are intermediate. Okay, so I'm gonna wind up now with just the result we can't explain. So we found a, not only various forms of reproductive isolation between these flies, but we've also found ecological isolation and something about its underlying basis. These flies differ in their preference for temperature, and they differ in their tolerance for temperature, and that has to explain something about why they're altitudinally zonated on that island. And because they live in different places, that keeps them from meeting in general and is a, something that restricts gene flow. Now, I'll leave you with a mystery. This is the altitudinal distribution of the flies I gave before. Yucuba at the bottom, tolerant to high temperatures, prefers high temperatures. Santa May at the top above 1,500 meters. It's getting cold here as you go up the mountain. Um, they tolerant not tolerant of high temperatures, and they prefer low temperatures. But the graph stops at 1,700 meters. Remember, the mountain is 2,024 meters. What happens if you keep going higher up? You get in the second hybrid zone. In fact, what you find at the top of the mountain, above 1,900 meters, is 100% hybrids of these two species. Okay, And this is, I mean, there aren't many flies up there because it's sparse. Um, but the, this represents 140 flies, which is every fly we've been able to trap at the top of the mountain. Every single one of them is a hybrid, and that observation that those hybrids is stable over six years and two seasons. I think it's seven years now. We've only caught hybrids at the top. Now, you can imagine that this is puzzling, because these are hybrids between two species, one of which does not live there. So how do they get there in the first place? I mean, here you have a hybrid zone because both species live there, and they can meet and mate each other. Here we have a hybrid zone between flies that don't even live in the same area, and yet they're hybrids. So this raises a number of questions. First of all, the hybrid zone is outside the range of Drosophila and Cuba. Where do they come from? Are they generated lower down, and they fly up to the top of the mountain? If, why would they do that? I mean, you've already seen that the preference, the temperature preference of these F1 hybrids is not anomalous. That's why I showed you that graph of temperature preference. These flies are F1 hybrids. They do not have a temperature preference for extreme cold. So it's not like they're flying up there because they're cold. More important, all the hybrids in the upper zone are males. 140 out of 140 flies that we found there are males. If you cross these things in the lab, 50% males, 50% females. Where are the females? Why are there only males that hybrid zone? All of the three hybrids are F1 males, and three of those are bat cross males. Why are there so few bat cross flies? Probably because there's no females in this zone to produce bat cross flies. And then to me, this is one of the biggest mysteries. Because if they're all males up there, we can genotype them and find out which cross they come from, because their X chromosome will come from the mother. That's the way genetics works. And every single male, 
that we've ever caught at the high altitude comes from the cross of Drosophila santomaya females by Drosophila ecuma males. That is the cross that is the one that's almost impossible to make in the laboratory. It's the hard cross, not the easy cross, and yet that's what we find in nature. So what is happening here? Is there some difference in mating discrimination in nature between, uh, between difference from nature in the laboratory? Where are the parents of these flies up at the top of the mountain? Where do they come from? And why are they all males instead of females? And the answer to all three of those questions is, I don't know. We have no idea. I mean, you're going to be thinking of some ideas, but I can tell you that we've tested them, and they're wrong. <laughs> okay? we, we don't know. All we know is we have a replicable phenomenon, and it's, it defies my understanding. Of all the things I've done in my career, this is the most puzzling. And I don't know how to answer this question at all. So the conclusion of this work, um, first of all, that even early in speciation, there are multiple isolating barriers. There's not just one thing that causes speciation at the beginning. Lots of different things evolve concurrently that cause gene flow to be impeded. And that makes sense because it's probably a byproduct of natural selection, and all these barriers are probably byproducts of selection, so they're all going to evolve in concert with the natural selection that causes the species to diverge. There's not much introgression. These are very good, well-isolated species, despite the ubiquitous assertion that species exchange genes promiscuously in nature. Here's two species that don't, and they live in the same place. Speciation was almost certainly allopatric due to double colonization. There's no reinforcement for sexual isolation, although we can get that in the laboratory, and I'll tell you, if you want, I'll tell you the difference. Species are adaptively different in temperature preference and tolerance, so we have an ecological barrier as well. And this is pretty unique in Drosophila. If you study Drosophila, the first thing you learn is forget about studying ecology. Well, we've been able to do a little bit of it. And finally, the hybrid zone is plenty weird. We just have no idea of why we repeatedly go back to the island and always find hybrids at the top of the mountain and right over on the other side. So, um, I'd like to thank the people that helped me with this work. Um, these are the students of the laboratory, many of undergraduates, including our lab cat, Maya. Um, our field work, that's Daniel Matute, my last student, Ana Yopart, my postdoc, and our team of guides, Lucio Primo Montero, he's the head guide. Without him and his team, we wouldn't have been able to haul all this banana mash up the, I mean, 80 pounds of banana mash to go up, you know, a slippery trail is not an easy thing to do. And Daniel Matute did most of the work on reinforcement as well. Here he is pretending to read Darwin. And Trudy McKay, who did a lot of the uh, DNA isolation. And finally, I, as always, I'd like to dedicate this talk to Daniel Lachez, who was the discoverer of Drosophila santabea. And he collected flies in every country in Africa in his life. He, he, there's nothing more that this man loved than collected flies. Unfortunately, he had a congenital heart defect. All of his brothers died at the age of 30 or 40. And he had a double bypass at the age of 35. And his doctor told him, don't go to Africa. Stop going to Africa because you're going to kill yourself. It's just too strenuous. But he loved flies more than he loved life. And so he kept going to Africa. And soon after our last trip there with him, he was changing a tire in his car. And he collapsed and died. But none of this work would have been possible without this wonderful man. And I wanted to dedicate this talk to him. And thank you very much. <laughs>